I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with section 5-8, Coup d'etat, by Edward Lutwak. Moving on in chapter 3, the strategy of the coup d'etat. Infiltrating the Armed Forces Our initial survey of the armed forces of the target country will have isolated two items of information which are crucial to the planning of the coup. These are the nature and composition of the units which have an intervention capability and the real operational echelon within them. This data is illustrated in the notional table below. Table 2. Country X, Potential Forces of Intervention A. Battalion Size Force 1,000 men organized in 10 companies with mechanical transport and anti-tank weapons. Location, capital city, operational echelon, battalion headquarters. B. Division size force. 1,500 men organized in 20 companies with armored carriers, 25 tanks. Location, 30 kilometers from capital city, operational echelon, brigade headquarters. Tanks under separate battalion headquarters. C. Brigade size force. 3,000 men organized in three battalions. Location. 300 kilometers from capital city. Air transport available. Operational echelons, brigade headquarters, and air force squadron headquarters. Hitherto, we have been thinking in terms of formal military units. But we must now carry our analysis further in order to identify the key individuals within each particular unit. If we were dealing with a primitive military organization, we could readily isolate those who would effectively lead the unit concerned. In the tribal war band, for example, there will be a few obvious leader types, distinguished by their appearance and less obviously by their descent or personal repute. The other warriors will only be functionally different from each other because of their individual strength or dexterity. In modern military organizations, it is otherwise. The efficiency of the organization depends on the use of many different types of weapons and other facilities, handled by specialized personnel. In each situation, there will be an appropriate mix of these in the system, therefore depends on two kinds of key individuals, the technicians and those who coordinate them, the leaders. Our next problem, therefore, is to determine who are the key individuals within those units of the armed forces which could intervene for or against us during the coup. As we have already determined, which is the operational echelon within each particular formation and thus implicitly identified the leaders, we now turn to the identification of the technicians. Who these are will depend on the nature of the organization and the task to be carried out. If, for example, during the course of the coup, the government calls on the help of Force C in our notional Table 2, its arrival in the capital would be prevented with the cooperation of just one of these groups. 1. The staff operating the communication system between the political leadership and the Force C. 2. The pilots and or ground staff of the air transport squadron. 3. The guard force at the airport. 4. The control tower personnel at either airport, especially in difficult flying conditions. In general, the more sophisticated the organization, the greater is its efficiency, but also its vulnerability. Either Force A or Force B in Table 2 could, for example, operate successfully, even if quite a few of its personnel were not cooperating with the leadership. For these forces, losing the cooperation of 10% of their men would mean losing approximately 10% of their effectiveness. In the case of Force C, however, the loss of perhaps 1% of its men could lead to a total loss of effectiveness for some particular tasks, such as intervening in the capital city. This indicates that insofar as we are trying to neutralize a formation of the armed forces, we should do so through the cooperation of technicians rather than leaders, because the former are both more effective individually and easier and safer to recruit. The second rule is that we should, other things being equal, choose for neutralization those units which have the most complex organization, while choosing the simplest ones for incorporation. This will both reduce our vulnerability from a sudden defection and minimize the total number of people that must be ultimately recruited. Before we go on to approach and persuade the key individuals to join us, thus giving us effective control of their units, we must have collected sufficient information on the armed forces to know A, which are the military units which could intervene at the time and place of the coup, B, the real command structure within the relevant units and who are the leaders, C, the technical structure of the units and who are the technicians. To incorporate a unit, we will need the active cooperation of a number of its leaders, and in the case of a technically simple unit, the defection of some technicians will not matter greatly. 
if, in otherwise well-infiltrated units, some of the leaders should remain loyal to the pre-coup regime, this should not prove to be a major obstacle. Whether we concentrate on leaders or on technicians will depend on the particular structure of the effective forces of intervention and on the particular political climate. If there is a sharp political division between the troops and their officers, we may be able to incorporate units without the cooperation of any formal leaders at all. The problem of identifying the unofficial leaders will, however, be a very difficult one, and in any case there is no reason to believe that we are planning the coup at a time when such division has hardened. The technical structures, however, are more stable, and one of our principal considerations will be to avoid being dependent on too many links of the technical chain. Table 3 shows our optimum strategy on in infiltrating a typical set of potential intervention forces. Of course, in countries prone to coups, those who order these things are aware of their vulnerability to defection of parts of the armed forces. It's therefore quite likely that the Easy Battalion No. 1 has been carefully chosen for its reliability and its commanders are trusted associates of the ruling group. If this is the case, we may have to work on Battalion No. 3. What we must not do is rely on Battalion No. 2, because the defection from our cause of even a few of its technicians would have dramatic consequences. Until we actually start to collect information about the individuals and to make the first approaches, we may not know which units are politically tied to the regime, and more generally we will not know who are our ultimate recruitment prospects in each unit. Therefore, though we will have a rough classification in mind, dividing the units into potential allies and potential neutrals, we should keep the distinction flexible. As we build up a picture of the recruitment potential in each unit, we will concentrate our efforts on the units to be incorporated. The reliability of a unit allied to the coup will be increased if we infiltrate it in depth, but there is little point in over-infiltrating a unit which will eventually be neutralized. Every approach to an individual will involve an element of risk. Every increase in the number of those who know that something is up will reduce the overall security level. We must therefore avoid over-recruitment. Table 3. Optimum Infiltration Strategy Unit. Battalion number 1. Battalion number 2. Battalion number 3. Command. 10 company commanders and 5 effective leaders at the headquarters of each battalion. For infiltration in depth, 30 platoon commanders have to be subverted in each battalion. Key men. 15 to 45 leaders. Tactical structure, very simple. Relies on ordinary communication and transportation equipment. Key men, 15 to 45 leaders, very co te technical structure, very complex. To bring the force to the scene of the coup, airlift and sophisticated communications are required. Key men, 15 to 45 leaders, technical structure, medium. Relies on land transport, but radio links need to operate communications. Key men, of the very simple technical structure. Optimum strategy, no technicians, bring a proportion of the leaders over to the coup. Of the very complex technical structure, key men, optimum strategy. 40 technicians, secure the passive cooperation of some of the technicians. Key men, 15 to 45 leaders, medium technical structure. Key men, five technicians, if battalion number one proves difficult to infiltrate, this one would be the second choice. Moving on. If we go up to an army officer and ask him to join in a projected coup, he will be faced, unless he's a total loyalist, with a set of options, offering both dangers and opportunities. The proposition could be a plant of the security authorities to determine his loyalty to the regime. The proposition could be genuine, but part of an insecure and inefficient plot, and finally, the proposition could come from a team that has every chance of success. Should the proposal be a plant, accepting it would lose him his job and much more, while reporting it would gain him the rewards of loyalty. Should it be a genuine proposal, he has the uncertain prospect of benefiting after a coup, as against the certain prospect of benefiting immediately from reporting it. The natural thing for him to do, therefore, is to report it. The whole technique of the approach is designed to defeat this logic. Apart from the rewards of being part of a successful coup, which can be portrayed as being significantly greater than the rewards of loyalty, there's another factor which operates in our favor. That is that the person to whom an approach is reported may himself be a supporter of the coup. We must therefore emphasize these two points as much as possible, while underplaying the risk element. But hopefully our potential recruits will be motivated by some considerations beyond greed and fear, with other interests and affiliations entering their choice. Links of friendships with the planners of the coup and a shared political outlook will be important, but usually the crucial considerations will be family, clan, and ethnic links with those planning the coup. In most economically backward countries, the different ethnic groups are only imperfectly fused into one entity, and mass education and mass communications have not by any means broken down traditional rivalries and suspicions. In any case, the first steps toward economic progress usually reinforce these conflicts, and we may end up finding that ethnic links are far more important than more recent political affiliations.
For example, when no steel mills were being built, there could be no regional conflicts on where to build them. When civil service jobs were all given to citizens of the imperial power, there could be little conflict between ethnic groups on the fair allocation of jobs. Conflicts over jobs or the location of steel mills are necessarily more intense than the old conflicts over land. While before only the geographical fringes of the tribe were in contact with the rival, now each tribe fights the other on the national stage. While the conflict over land can reach a compromise at some middle line, a steel mill has to be located in either Area A or Area B. The alternative, of course, is to put it on the border of the two provinces. Although this is usually far from roads and other facilities, it is sometimes done. As all the conflicts widen in scope and intensity, the instinctual solidarity of the ethnic group hardens. African tribalism is merely an extreme case of a very general phenomenon. For example, sophisticated and utterly non unreligious Jews will happen to marry other Jews, though they may regard themselves as thoroughly assimilated. Despite Czech and Slovak protestations of national unity, capital investment has had to be assigned carefully to each area on an exact percentage basis, and conflict over this was one of the factors which brought down the Novotny, the great survivalist, government in 1968. In fact, all over Eastern Europe, the old conflicts are just below the surface, and the new socialist national policies are inevitably reviving them. In Romania, almost half a million Germans and a million and a half Hungarians feel that they are not getting a fair deal, while in Yugoslavia, Croat Serbs, Dalmatians, and Macedonians are all involved in the ethnic balancing act, not to speak of the smaller Albanian, Vlach, and Slovene groups. In many areas, ethnic divisions are complicated by a superimposed religious conflict. The Igbo nation in Nigeria, for example, has been an endemic conflict with the Muslim northerners for a very long time, but the introduction of Christianity among them has meant that the old Igbo Hausa conflict has been intensified by a new Muslim Christian one. We will therefore make the fullest use of the ethnic matrix without, however, aligning our coup with any particular ethnic faction. In terms of petty tactic tactics, we will match each potential recruit with a recruiter who shares his affiliation, and if necessary, the image of the coup will be presented in a similar vein. But we must also take account of the special factor which is a typical post-colonial phenomenon. Colonial regimes developed the habit of recruiting army personnel among minority ethnic groups, which were reputed to be more warlike and more important could be trusted to join in the repression of the majority group with enthusiasm. After independence, these minorities naturally regressed in terms of political power and social position, but they still staffed much of the armed forces. This has led to the strange spectacle of minorities acting as the official protectors of the regime, which is putting the pressure on them. The Druze and Alawites of Syria have been in this position since the French departed in 1945, and it's hardly surprising that disaffected officers of the two groups have played a prominent role in most of the many coups since independence. In many parts of Africa, the majority people are the reputedly soft coastal tribes, who've captured the political leadership because of superior numbers and education, while much of the army is made up of members of the smaller hill tribes. This is the result of the superficial ethnographic theory that the British learned in India and the French in Algeria, but which, in African conditions was little less than absurd. As soon as the officers of the colonial country landed in a new territory, they set about finding the hills and once there, tried to recreate their semi-homosexualizing relationship with the wily Pathan or Lafir Cabal by recruiting the supposedly tough hillmen into their army. Without setting the stage for the intertribal civil war, there is every incentive to make use of this factor, but to the extent that there is an effective political life, the ideological outlook of the potential recruit will also be important. As far as we are concerned, combining all ranges of the political spectrum against a right or left extreme will give the most suitable political cover to our coup. The Qassam regime in Iraq, which lasted for five years as a pure balancing act, was finally brought down in 1963, when the moderate nationalist Aref Abdel Salam persuaded all political factions, from left-wing Ba'ath to right-wing conservatives, to combine against that supposed communist penetration in the government. There's another table here. Table 4. The Role of Ethnic Minorities in Syrian Politics The Druze 1949, April The first post-colonial regime of President Kuatli tries and fails to destroy the power base of a major Druze clan. This was one of the factors which led to the pioneering coup of Husni al-Zaim, the first military dictator in the Arab world. 1949, August Husni al-Zaim overthrown by a group of officers, of whom many are Jews. This followed the attempt to intimidate the Jews' Jabal area. The crucial armored suit of commanders were Jews whose cooperation had been enlisted by the planners of the coup. 1949 in December. The new regime starts its attempt to unite Syria with Iraq, and a new coup is planned to overthrow it and stop the Union. Jews' officers of the armored unit carry out the coup, which leads to Shislaki's military dictatorship. 1954, February. 
Shishlaki's regime overthrown. This was preceded by his military occupation of the Jabal Druze area and his arrest of a Druze delegation, which led to disturbances and reprisals. The group which carried out the coup was composed of three factions, of which the Druze was perhaps the most important. The Alawites. 1966, February. Coup by the leftist Ba'ath against the rightist Ba'ath regime of Hafiz and the party members Emma Flak and Esbitar. The coup was supposedly based on the ideological rift within the Ba'ath movement. In fact, the government of the leftist Ba'ath was a cover for a group of Alawite officers headed by Salah Jadid, himself an Alawite. 1967, February. The chief of staff, a Sunni Muslim, is replaced by an Alawite. Political power retained by the Alawite-controlled National Revolutionary Council, with Sunni and Christian Arab ministers as figureheads. Moving on. If there's no extreme faction available, however, we will have to be content with the petty tactics of claiming political kinship with potential recruits. But apart from the virtues of honesty, there is a need for a consistency and a systematic presentation of the coup in terms of divergent political lines may eventually lead to our undoing. Finding out the ethnic group to which a particular officer belongs is relatively easy. Finding out what is his political outlook is rather more difficult. But the hardest thing of all will be to find out if he's personally alienated from the higher military leadership. Only the family and his closest friends of an officer will know whether he feels that his superiors are treating him unfairly, or running things badly, to the extent that he would welcome a radical change in the whole setup. Unless we have a direct line to the individual concern, we will have to use outside information to determine his inner feelings. The standard intelligence procedure is to follow the career pattern of officers, in order to find out which ones have been passed over for promotions, assuming, other things being equal, that they will make good prospects for recruitment. In many countries, promotions within the armed forces are announced in official gazettes, and starting from a particular class at the military academy, one can follow the careers of each officer from their graduation to the present. In some countries, where promotions are not published for security reasons, one can carry out the exercise by using back copies of the telephone directory where their names will be printed along with their changing ranks. Whereas in the Soviet Union, neither telephone directories nor official gazettes are good sources of information, we could use more disparate expedients. Getting an old boy from the relevant years to circulate proposals for a reunion, or building up mini biographies from personal acquaintances. By whatever means, our aim would be to trace a reasonably accurate career history for each graduating class from the military academy. The competitive position of each officer will be established vis-a-vis -vis others of his year, rather than the other officers of the formation in which he serves, and Table 5 presents the information in the appropriate framework. Table 5, Class of 19, Military Academy of Country X, Present Career Position, Lieutenant, 7, Captain, 55, Major, 33, Colonel, 18, Brigadier, 2, Deceased or Civilian, 15, for a total of 130. The seven lieutenants will probably make eager results for anything that will disturb and rearrange the order. But their low rank may be a correct assessment of their abilities, in which case their help may be a liability. More generally, and more usefully, we will know that the captains and majors in our table may well be less enthusiastic about the setup than the colonels, while the two brigadiers, if not actually appointed for their political reliability, have probably become staunch supporters of whoever gave them their exalted jobs. Ethnic affiliation, political outlook, and career patterns will all serve as guides to the likely reaction of the potential recruit when the approach is made. There are, however, two points that we have to bear in mind, the first organizational and the second deeply human. While alienated personnel will make good recruits, we must remember that we need people who will not only cooperate personally, as in the case of the technicians, but also bring the units they command over to the coup. Thus, while the leaders we recruit could and should be estranged from the superior hierarchy, they must not be outsider figures who are not trusted by their fellow officers and men. There will often be a danger of attracting the inefficient, the unpopular, the corrupt, as well as the disaffected. If we allow our coup to be assisted by such men, we will be endangering the security of the coup and discouraging the recruitment of the better elements. And most important of all, we may find that our leader recruits will fail to bring their units with them. The other point to bear in mind is the basic unpredictability of human behavior. We have so far been trying to establish which links could override the loyalty of army personnel to their superiors, and of these affiliations, the strongest may be expected to be a family link. We should not, however, place total reliance on this factor. Although there's an Arab proverb, I and my brother against my cousin, I and my cousin against the world, we should remember that the Arab family history in Iraq be between 1958 and 1968. The relationship between the brothers illustrates the difficulty of predicting human behavior. 
Between 1958 and 1962, one brother was in prison under a suspended death sentence, while the other was in charge of a force that could probably have moved on the capital at any time. The Ba'ath leaders, mindful of this precedent, allowed Abdib al-Rahman to remain in charge of the important armored units near Baghdad, and this was their undoing. There was a period, immediately after the first coup of 63, when the position of the presidential brother was weak and the Ba'ath Party militia, totally untrained but heavily armed, could have been used to remove the military brother from his command. The Ba'ath leaders, however, assumed that Abd al-Rahman could not collaborate with his brother and would behave as he did in 1958 and 1959-62. to This time he behaved differently, in spite of the fact that he was helping a brother who needed help much less badly than in 1958-62. to When he was a captive and under a death sentence, or perhaps because of this. Despite such instances of human unpredictability, and bearing in mind the individuality of our prospective recruits, we can nevertheless use the information we have collected to rank the leaders in terms of their probable cause. Table 6. The RF Brothers in Iraq, 1958-1968, to 1968, A Study in Loyalty. The recent ruler of Iraq, President Abd al-Rahman RF, was chosen as a compromise candidate by the army after the accidental death of his brother, Abd al-Salam, the previous dictator of Iraq, in April 1966. The career pattern of the two brothers shows that, while both were prominent army leaders, one did not always cooperate with the other. Okay, July 1958. The coup overthrows the monarchy. Abd al-Salam is the co-author of the coup with Qassam. Abd al-Rahman is unaware of the plans and only intervenes at the end, though commander of an important armored unit. Okay, now, November 1958. Abd al-Salam, Qassam arrests Abd al-Salam, accused of treason and giving a remitted death sentence. Abd al-Rahman is promoted and placed in charge of a large army contingent. 1962, Abd al-Rahman is placed in retirement. February 1963, the Ba'ath coup. Abd al-Salam is released and made president. Abd al-Rahman, placed in charge of the 5th Armored Division, promoted to brigadier general. Qassam deposed and shot. November 1963, anti-Ba'ath coup. Abd al-Salam assumes full control. Abd al-Rahman is promoted again. April 1966, Abd al-Salam dies. Abd al-Rahman emerges as a compromised presidential candidate of the army. Having established the career histories and ethnic and political affiliations of possible recruits, we can proceed to weigh our prospects as illustrated in Table 7. In evaluating the information, we must of course bear in mind that the importance to be attached to each factor will differ from one environment to another. In Latin America, for example, social background would have had to be added, while in Western Europe and North America, political allegiance would be paramount. Ethnic affiliation would be of little importance, but social background would carry some weight. Thus, out of 15 potential recruits, we see that number three is the one only totally good prospect from the point of view of the factors here taken into consideration. Number five is totally bad and probably dangerous to approach at all. The others, however, will be somewhere in the middle. In table seven, I'm not really going to read because it's just a lot of symbols and checks and X and sevens and nines and... But just, you know, bear with it. Once we have repeated the procedure followed in the case of Battalion Number 1, and we've covered all the other formations of the armed forces, or at any rate those with effective intervention capability, we will know the overall recruitment prospects of each unit and within them of each individual. We will never be able to achieve a 100% coverage. In some cases, where the armed forces are very large in relation to our resources, or frequently redeployed, our coverage may be very incomplete. This will not matter greatly if the unknown units can be neutralized technically. If, however, their intervention capability does not depend on elaborate and vulnerable facilities, then the coup may be jeopardized. We do not, however, depend on the incorporation and the neutralization procedures alone. And we will also be able to isolate physically those units which appear on the scene unexpectedly and those which we have not been able to infiltrate at all. Before looking at the problems involved in the third and least desirable of our methods of dealing with armed opposition, we must turn our attention to the subversion of individuals in the units where we do have the requisite information. As soon as we emerge from the close security of the planning and information stage, the danger factor in our activities will increase very sharply. As we have pointed out earlier, every single individual we approach will be a potential informer who by telling the authorities about our efforts could lead to the collapse of the coup. 
The most dangerous person to approach will be the first in each particular formation, because until we have his cooperation, we will not have a really intimate source of information about the unit and its members. Our first recruit must therefore be a long-standing member of that particular formation, and if at all possible, he must be a senior officer, or even the commander. Once we have chosen our man, the first step will be to arrange a meeting and to sound him out in vague and generalized terms about the possibilities of achieving political reform. These soundings must be conducted by a man or men who fulfill certain exacting qualifications. He or she must be a trusted associate of high caliber without, however, being the inner, inner group planning the coup. In other words, he must be both valuable and expendable. This is an ideal which we can only try to approximate, but it should, could be fatal to expose a member to the inner group to the possibility of being betrayed to the authorities. In the coup country par excellence, Syria, political leaders have in fact gone around the barracks canvassing for support, but the special conditions of Syrian political life are not likely to be reproduced elsewhere. Once the potential recruit has been brought to the state, when the possibility of a coup has been openly discussed, he should be told three things about the coup. A, the political aim. B, that we have already recruited other individuals and units. And C, the nature of the task that he will be asked to perform. Everything we say or arrange to be said to the political recruit will be, have to be studied carefully, and we will work on the assumption that every recruit may be double working for the security services. We will not, of course, identify our coup with any particular party whose policies would be known, nor with any political faction whose leading personalities will be known. We will instead state the aim of the coup in terms of a political attitude rather than in terms of policies or personalities, because the latter are necessarily more specific and therefore liable to specific opposition. The attitude which we will project will have to be calculated carefully. It should reflect the preoccupations of the target country, implying a solution to the problems which are felt to exist, and in form it must reflect the general political beliefs of the majority of its people. Thus, in Britain, we could speak of the need for more business-like government. One can even imply, whether truthfully or not, that the coup is linked with prominent public figures such as newspaper proprietors, big businessmen, or the chairman of a nationalized industry. In Latin America, the attitude presented may, for example, imply that the sacred trust of the armed forces requires intervention to clear the mess made by the politicians in order to achieve social and national progress while respecting property rights slash individual rights. If the pre-coup government is itself the product of a seizure of power, then the aims of the coup can be presented purely in terms of restoring normal political life, or if we are ultra-leftists, we can speak about the need to restore democracy. Making up slogans may seem to be an easy game, but in fact our slogans will have to be calculated carefully to satisfy a political optimum. We must, for example, avoid being specific, but if the attitude we present is too general, it will stimulate the suspicions of the shooter of our listeners, while failing to fire the enthusiasm of the more idealistic ones. We must also remember that the armed forces of many countries are often politically and psychologically out of tune with civilian society, and that they could have distinct and perhaps antagonistic preoccupations and beliefs. As citizens... Army officers may share the belief that there ought to be economies in government expenditure, but at the same time feel that the armed forces are being starved of funds. Where the social status of military personnel has suffered a decline because of defeat in battle, or just a long peace, we will always emphasize the need to restore the defenders of society to their proper place within it. In presenting the aims of the coup to potential recruits, we should exercise a measure of flexibility in order to reach a good fit with what we know to be their beliefs. We cannot, however, run the risk of being exposed as being grossly inconsistent. Whether we hold the views that will make up our image does not matter at all as long as the other conditions are satisfied. It's incidentally polite to indicate that the coup is only being carried out with extreme reluctance, and that we appreciate this reluctance is shared by our recruit. Once the idea of the coup has gained a measure of acceptance in the minds of our potential recruit, we should define the coup in terms of his role within it. This will not imply that we will reveal any of the operational detail, but we should make it quite clear that a. his role will be limited to a few specific actions, b. almost everybody in his unit is already with us, and c. therefore his role will be a safe one. When and only when the recruit becomes actual, rather than potential, we can reveal to him the nature of his actual task. This will be described in the greatest possible detail, but not so as to enable the recruit to work out the implications of the task he is asked to perform. If, for example, the recruit in question is destined to use his unit to provide muscle for a roadblock team, he will be told what equipment his men should have, how many will be required, and how he will receive the ghost signal. He will not be told the date of the coup, the place where his roadblock will be, or what the other teams will be doing. Information is the greatest asset we have, and much of our advantage in the planning stage will derive from the fact that, while we know a great deal about the differences of the state, those who control them know very little about us. 
We must therefore make every effort to avoid getting any information beyond what is actually required. In any case, while the recruit may feel that he ought to know more about the coup before he agrees to participate in it, he will also feel more secure if we show concretely that the operation is being run with great caution and is therefore secure. After the first few recruits in each unit have been made, the others in it will be much easier to persuade. There will also be more people to do the persuading, because this is the purpose to which we will put our first recruits, in the interval between their initial recruitment and the actual coup. Also a snowball, or hopefully an avalanche effect, will be generated by the first recruits, who will gradually create a climate in which it will be easier to recruit further. After the approach and persuasion of the key individuals has begun to give its results, we will be able to identify the units which will eventually be used as active participants in the coup. These will be a small part of the armed forces as a whole, but hopefully the only part that will be able to play an active role at the time in place of the coup. We will concentrate our further efforts on them because their infiltration in depth will be of value to us, whereas the over-neutralization of the other forces will merely involve further risk. Ideally, we will have neutralized all those formations which we have not incorporated. But this is not likely to be the case. The methods that we will follow to isolate these formations that we have not been able to penetrate will be discussed in Chapter 4. The degree of success required of our infiltration program before we can proceed to the operational phase will depend on the military, political, and geographical factors involved. The same degree of penetration may ensure success in one country while being inadequate in another. In our Portuguese example, because of the extensive deployment of the active troops in the remote African provinces and the lack of training and mechanization of the troops stationed in Portugal, we could go ahead with minimal penetration. Table 8. Infiltration of the armed forces in Portugal. Notion. Total armed forces, 150,000. Incorporated as active participants, 3,000. Neutralized by subversion of key technicians, 12,000. Neutralized by unsuitable training and equipment, 45,000. Neutralized by their location, Angola, Mozambique, and Portuguese Guinea, 45,000, 25,000, 20,000. For a total of 150,000. This is an extreme example of a small and poor country which is trying to retain its African empire to the bitter end, which is therefore only leaving a very small force in its own metropolitan territory. The degree of incorporation achieved here is only about 2%, and yet the coup would not find any military opposition in its way unless it failed to impose its authority within the time span required to bring into Lisbon the troops stationed in the African provinces. The fact that the present regime is far from universally popular would reinforce the favorable military factors. If, however, we take the case of a developed country with good transport links and with no overseas commitments for its troops, the same percentages of incorporation and active neutralization, which in the Portuguese case would guarantee success, would lead to a certain failure, as illustrated in Table 9. Table 9. Infiltration of the armed forces in West Germany. Notion. Total armed forces. 450,000. Incorporated as active participants. 9,000. Neutralized by the subversion of key technicians. 40,000. Neutralized by unsuitable equipment, mainly Air Force and Navy, 180,000. Balance of forces under the control of the government, 221,000. Since there's nothing that we can do to prevent the large forces capable of intervention from doing so, we would almost certainly fail unless we were the higher leadership of the armed forces. Most situations will be between the two extremes. With a small percentage of the armed forces incorporated, a larger percentage neutralized by our efforts, and a very small percentage to be isolated by severing from the outside its communication and transport facilities. Apart from the military forces, the government will also be defended by police forces and their paramilitary extensions, and we now turn to the problem of their neutralization. Thus finishes Section 5.8 of Coup d'Etat by Edward Lutwek. We're still working on Chapter 3, The Strategy of the Coup d'Etat, which we will continue with tomorrow, in Section 5.9, Neutralizing the Police. I will see you then. Alam.